there's always been this great conspiracy theory about The Simpsons. We predict the future. We predict the future. That's, there's going to be thousands and thousands of bad ideas or crazy ideas and silly jokes sometimes come true. <laughs> does that make us prognosticators? I think oh, does I, it? Uh, come in, come in. Jay Kogan is a four-time Emmy Award-winning writer, producer, director, actor, and a world-renowned storyteller known for his work as a creative force behind the iconic shows like The Simpsons, Frasier, Everybody Loves Raymond, Henry Danger, Wendell and Minnie, School of Rock, Happily Divorced, Malcolm in the Middle, George Lopez, The Tracy Ullman Show, and many more. Most recently, you can find him telling stories on his podcast, Don't Be Alone with Jay Kogan. In this episode, Jay gives us a masterclass on all things jokes. We discuss how understanding comedy leads to better dramatic characters. When I was first starting out, I just want to be funny. I've learned that funny is great. Funny in the service of story is even better. The difference between writing for episodic TV versus variety shows versus film. The Tracy Ullman show was very limiting and going to right then to The Simpsons was incredibly freeing. And Jay reveals what it was like predicting the future on The Simpsons. Okay, storytellers, join me in welcoming Jay Kogan to the studio. This episode was brought to you in partnership with Little Black Tux. Little Black Tux is my go-to when I need a timeless look. Whether I'm speaking on a film panel, walking a red carpet, or need a bold, sophisticated look for a photo shoot, Little Black Tux has me covered. Little Black Tux isn't just a clothing company, they're a company with a story, a strong why. And you know I love a good story. They're breaking boundaries and creating clothing that empowers women with versatile, upscale options. I love my little black tux, and I know you will too. Jay, welcome to Curiosity Storyteller Studio. It's great to be here. I sound very impressive with your uh, introduction. I don't think I'm that impressive, but thank you. You are that impressive. A, a primal force in all those shows. I don't know. I was there. I don't know if I was the uh, leading one. force, but it's okay. One of the forces. All right. Yeah. One I'm, of I'm the, a force. One of the forces. I'm a, I'm a force. So let's just start at the beginning. Where did you grow embryo. up? Embryo. I was an embryo, yes. And that was... Uh, I've heard we've all been embryos. That's yes, true, yes. I don't quite right. remember it, but I'm sure no. it was absolutely... Yeah. You know, I, I had a diary when I was an embryo, so I recorded all of that, so that I remember it. That actually makes a lot of sense. <laughs> it makes a lot of sense. Yes. Where did you grow up? I grew up... Well, I was born in New York City, in Brooklyn, New York. For the first five years I was in Brooklyn, uh, I was a member of a couple gangs. Gangs? But, but then I got out of there... And then I moved to uh, Los Angeles, where my family moved to Woodland Hills and then uh, Encino. So then I was in the gangs of Encino for a long time. I've heard the gangs of Encino yeah. are just... Mm. Oh, it's brutal. I mm. think uh, Martin Scorsese is going to do a film about it soon. But uh, it was great. Like I grew up in the Valley before there were cell phones, so it was sort of... Kids would ride their bicycles and, and disappear and then you know come back when it was dark and... We would just, uh, our parents left us alone <laughs> and didn't know what was going on. And I that's was, how we grew up. I was similar. We, were, yeah. I was in Ohio. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we did everything on our bikes. Yeah. It was just an excuse to be away from everybody, right? Yeah. We just go and hang out with people and do stuff. And and uh, my my childhood was, was was great. It was fantastic. My father was a TV writer. Yes. But, um, but I didn't live in Beverly Hills. So I didn't have a, an incredibly show busy life. I had some... A lot of show business exposure, but I was just much more of a of a middle class, goofy valley life. You talked a lot about um, in other interviews about your father and him being a writer and how that kind of made comedy in your household somewhat of a competition. Like oh, yeah. it was your way for getting attention. It was my, it was definitely my way of getting attention. It wasn't quite a competition because my my sister uh, <laughs> my sister was not playing that game. Okay, she was not, <laughs> my sister my sister did, wasn't desperate for her parents' approval, whereas I was. So I played the game, and and if my dad liked jokes, then I was going to do jokes, and uh, and if my mom whatever my mom liked, uh, I was going to do that too. So, um, but yes, my dad very joke. Oriented, he loved jokes, and if you told a joke and it could be better, he would punch your joke up at the dinner table, saying you should say it this way, you know, put the punchline at the end, shorten it, don't make it too long, that kind of stuff. 
uh, when I when I used to bring girls around who <laughs> also had dinner with my family, my father also used to correct their jokes, and they was like, "Who's this guy? That's Why funny. we're just having conversation?" Just well, nothing like not some embarrassing dad. parents picking up your I girlfriend's know. jokes and correcting. Very them. embarrassing. But uh, well, how do you feel that that dynamic uh, within your household kind of shaped? Because you ended up doing a lot of comedy that touched um, many different demographics, and you're really good at. It's family comedy specifically. I've been, there's a restraining order for me from touching many different demographics. <laughs> but I am, uh, I'm, tr- I'm trying to be better about it. Uh, but no, I, I, I'm, here's the thing. I like comedy. Comedy's great. It's, it's, uh, it's, to be funny, you have to be kind of smart. You have to be good at puzzles. You have to be good at con- conceptual thoughts and all that kind of stuff. And so as a child listening to George Carlin or listening to Bob Newhart uh, records or watching terrible sitcoms, uh, which I watched a lot of terrible sitcoms and a lot of good sitcoms, but I watched all those things. So you watch stories being broken half hour after half hour after half hour. You grow into this machine that goes, okay, well, I can do that. Um, And so, but comedy was, uh, was great. And it was kind of a hobby. And there were people who, at school, who also were comedy nerds. When right. Monty Python showed up, like, if people knew about Monty Python, which was on midnight at PBS, it wasn't something that everybody was watching. The ones who do, they were my group. They were my tribe. <laughs> and so you'd fit in with that tribe and go forth with those people. And, you know, it's not just, it was a, it's a social thing, not yeah. just a... You know, just a conceptual thing. So, I mean, Monty Python was a lot cooler than me. I was a I was a Disney kid. We sang Disney songs. Right, well, that was younger, our that was our tribe. You're younger than me. I went when Monty Python came up. It was really a sh- nobody knew about it. Like th- yeah. there were things that people didn't follow. SCTV was something that people didn't follow, but we did. Uh, Saturday Night Live was more popular. I watched that a lot, but. But uh, Monty Python, hugely influential. Mad Magazine, uh, hugely influential. National Lampoon Magazine, hugely influential. All these things people in my tribe uh, yeah. liked. And, and, we, and we enjoyed all the comedy movies and all the comedy shows and sort of talked about it. Do you remember a moment, like for me, I remember my dad reading me Black Beauty as a kid. And I remember that moment where I just fell in love with the story. Do yeah. you have a moment, a show, a comic? I think the... the the moment that really turned it was when your dad read Black Beauty to you. Was for me. It? Yeah. Yes. It really turned. I was like, well, holy I shit. I always felt your spirit there, Jay. I <laughs> uh, always felt your spirit yeah, there. Yeah. I don't remember my parents reading anything to me ever. But, uh, you know, I watched. There are movies that uh, and TV shows that hit me as a young uh, kid that I just thought were very, very cool. I mean, uh there's a movie called Bingo Long and the Travel- Traveling All-Stars and Motor Kings that I watched a thousand times. There's an old movie called The Court Jester, which is fantastic with Danny Kaye, that I watched a thousand times. A movie called Princess and the Pirate with Bob Hope, I watched a thousand times. So many, like all the James Bond movies. Yeah. Fantastic. Like, I'm, a, I'm swept up into that world. That's a world you can get swept up when you're eight. Yes. And it's harder to get swept up in when you're 43 because it's so stupid. But when you're eight, it's not stupid. It's cool. So all that cool space stuff and all that cool spy stuff and all the cool comedy stuff really uh, hit me. And I didn't watch shows for their stories. I watched shows because I was bored. Yeah. But it just, uh, 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 I absorbed them and then figured out how stories could be told based on the way they were doing it. Let's talk a little bit more about absorbing environments. Okay. Your, your first um, job on a television set was a Tracy Ullman show. You were a PA first. My first job on a television set was at the American Music Awards. Oh, wow. Uh, working for Dick Clark Productions. Okay. Um, actually, no. My f- very first job on a television set, I was five, and I was on the Dean Martin show. That's oh, my you, very first you job. You started in front of the camera. I started in front of the so camera. Did I. And I remember this. Dean Martin sang a song to my sister, and I was standing next to her, and we were extras in a Christmas special. And that was my first job. And I loved the environment of a, of a soundstage. And it seemed like people were having fun making something, you know, doing make ups And it was kind of cool to see the set. And the set was the part that everybody at home could see, but then you could see the cameras yeah, and the other stuff it. and go, okay, so this is pretend. This is kind of cool. So I was very, very hip to that. And I liked it. And I liked walking around the studio and seeing all the other mm-hmm. sets for all the other shows. 
and uh, and and so that was cool. So, but my first job as a PA, I believe, was on uh, was on the show. American Music Awards, um, where oh, I the got American Music Awards first. The American okay. Music Awards, and I got punched in the stomach by BB King. Oh no way! Yeah, what and happened? <laughs> yeah, I I think I've told this story before. It was my job at sixteen at a certain point to do a lot of things, but one of them was. At the end of the show, there was a party. It was one of the first American Music Awards, and they wanted all the celebrities to stay in the party. And their dressing rooms were kind of locked off, so they would stay in the party. Okay. Well, B.B. King wanted to go home, and my job was to stand in front of the dressing rooms and say, I'm sorry, uh, the dressing rooms are locked up, <laughs> and you have to uh, stay in the party. And he said, but my, my guitar, famous guitar Lucille, is in the dressing room. How, how old are you here? 16. So no small feet for no. a 16-year-old. <laughs> uh, BB King, taller than me, bigger than me. Uh, and he said, no, no, I'm sorry, Mr. King, you have to stay in the, uh, the party. Mr. Clark wants everybody to stay there. Says, and he said, I'm going to my dressing room. I said, I'm sorry, you, <laughs> you can't go to your dressing room. He said it politely three or four times, and three or four times I tried to rebuff him. Oh, and on the, you know, the fifth time, he said, I'm going to my dressing room. And he took his fist and he punched me in the stomach and literally moved me to the side with his fist Whoa. as he walked into his dressing room <laughs> to go get his guitar and leave. That's insane. You got punched yeah. by B.B. King I as did. a 16-year-old. Yeah. And, ye and yelled at by Reba McIntyre. But that's fine. Now that's yeah. a story. Uh, yeah. I want to talk a little bit about how these experiences shaped your way of storytelling. Well, so I stopped arguing with blues B. B. legends. King? With blues legends, all blues blues legends. I don't argue with them at all. Um, did you spend more time in front of the camera? I know you study as an actor. I was a uh, stand-up comedian. I was an actor. I, uh, I was a, a bunch of shows when I was a kid, but I wasn't going out on auditions like on a daily basis or anything like that. I was like, do you, getting do you think that changed your perspective when you went to tell stories, having had that experience? I was. I think I was just searching for where I fit in okay. to show business. Like what would I do? I what could I? That. What could I be? Uh, and I ran. You know, I also worked for a special effects guy working a smoke machine. Like I did <laughs> a lot of things. Tried a lot of things, but I was a PA. Uh, for I did writers. all these things. You know. I f I feel this story. Yeah. Deeply. So I'm trying to find my way and figure out what it was. It wasn't like my drive to tell stories. It mm -hmm. was my drive to sort of be in the business mm -hmm. and then find my spot. And it turned out my spot was writing. The one thing that people really wanted to pay me to do was write. And that's the one thing I was kind of trying to avoid. My dad was a writer. <laughs> he liked being in the writer's room. He liked, but when I saw him at home writing, he was, you know, it's, it's torture. It's writing is, is difficult and yep. torture. So I got to see that part and go, oh, I don't want any part of that. Uh, but then it turned out that uh, I was on a PA on It's Gary Shandling Show. That was one of the many shows. Of it's Gary Shandling Show. And my partner and I, who's a high school buddy of mine named uh, Wally Walidarski, said, let's try to write one. So we tried to write one. We respect one and then showed it to them. And they said, oh, this is great. But then they didn't want to buy it. Then we did, wrote another one. And then they also didn't want to buy that. But that script got us a <laughs> job, uh, uh, got us exposure to producer Sam Simon, who then was also working on the Tracy Ullman show. And he showed it to them. And they said, let's. Let these guys pitch us a sketch. We pitched them a bunch of sketches. They picked one. We wrote it. Then they hired us. So that's how we, we I got hired as a writer. Wow. Uh, pretty young. And my acting career was so sparse and my stand-up career was so shitty. And my I had already sort of gone through the groundling school in improv and done all that as far as that could go. So I was, I was writing. Um, between then and the next leg of your career, you worked over several different formats. So you were, of course, you talked about the American Music Awards, and then you worked at a variety show with the Tracy Ullman Show, and then you go into animation right. with The Simpsons, mm -hmm. and then you go into uh, family sitcom with Frasier, et cetera. When you're crossing over those different formats, how did you feel that shaped and changed the way that you tell stories today? The limitations weren't in the, st in the realm of stories. They were in the realm of production. So in production, in animation, you can write anything, and anything can be drawn, anything can be made, and it's not much more expensive to write a Super Bowl scene with thousands of people cheering than it is to write people at a table in animation. It's a little bit more, but not that much more. Um, in TV, it's incredible. You can't, on Frasier, you're not going to write a Super Bowl show where people are writing, you know, you have to write like a, a play. There's a set, there's like 
four sets a show. There's going to be a limited number of people in it. So those are the limitations. And the Tracy Ullman show was a sketch show. And we would have basically a set, one set to do a sketch, maybe two. And we'd have limited number of people. So that's the format that we were limited to, the budget of the show and what that show could tell. That's the box that we were telling our story in. Everything has a box. All stories have a box. All formats have a box. Movies have a box. TV shows have and a box. And I exist to kill that box. <laughs> <laughs> but they do. They have a box. A limitation. And limitation is your enemy, but it's also your friend. Because if you work within the box, that's... You need a limit to tell a story. You need to know where it... If you say, say to you, tell any story in the world, mm -hmm. go. You go, well, what do you mean? Give me, give me some direction. Ah, some direction. We all want some direction to tell the kind of story that we want to tell in this particular case. The box helps you limit yourself and figure out what story you want to tell. So yes, animation from going through the Tracy Ullman show was very limiting and going to right then to The Simpsons was incredibly freeing. We could tell, tell a joke in a quarter, an eighth of a page and move on. And where the Tracy Ullman show, you had to do a, a, yeah. a scene for 10, 10, 12 pages. It's a different, different form format. and a different format. So it, it was freeing. Then going back to Frasier um, years later, uh, was also more like a play, yes, um, and which was also great. And doing single Malcolm in the Middle was much more like a movie, yes. and you know, and and so I, I'm. But, I'm but thrilled the one, the one continuous across all yeah. these is your, and as someone who uh, writes and produces and, and and is working on all these different formats that you speak of, I humor is something that not everyone can get. And it's something you're incredibly talented at. Thank and you've you. You've been able to do that across all these different formats and, and with very different, as we said in the beginning, demographics. Right. <laughs> um, I wonder, like, is there a way that you observe people that you think is unique that really has helped you hone into? I know. There are a lot of funny people, so I wouldn't say that I'm unique. <laughs> I would say that... Uh, all writing, not just humorous writing, but all writing takes a certain amount of people who observe. Maybe helps a little bit to feel like you're an outsider. Yeah. A little bit like an alien. Yeah. So you're looking at the world through the eyes of an outsider. Mm -hmm. um, I certainly felt that way and still feel that way. I mean, here we're, we're in an environment that feels very alien to me. <laughs> I'm at a fancy bar with a fancy, <laughs> you know, pink walls and all this kind of stuff. It's like, it looks, it's made, it's a brand new building made to look like it was built in the 1930s. Like, yeah. it's what, what is this place? So that, I feel like an outsider here. But um, I can observe all of these things and take it in and use it to my advantage to tell stories. So that ultimately, we're, what I learned over time was not just being an outsider, not just observing the world, but what truth do I want to say? What ultimately... Do I want to say? When I was a kid, when I was first starting out, I just want to be funny. Tell jokes, joke after joke after joke. I want to make silly, jokey, funny things. The funniest thing, the greatest, the better. As I've gotten older, I've learned that funny is great, but funny in the service of story is even better. I, I happen to know that beyond the comedy that you are so well known for, you also are really great at creating emotional depth to characters across Not all genres. Not in my life, but in stories, yes. Across all genres. Yeah. And I love the alien nature of creatives and us trying to understand others through story. But specifically, when you are cultivating that type of emotional depth that we saw in Malcolm in the Middle um, and many of your other shows, is there a way that you blend the two to create like those? Because your, your shows are delightful. But then at the same time, there's real gripping characters in it. And I've read some of your dramas, too. They're really gripping characters. You want, you want um, gripping stories. I mean, the storytelling is its own thing. And you want to say, talk about interesting characters, put them in interesting situations, offer them conflict, offer them uh, uh, obstacles to, to go through their path. That's for drama and comedy. The difference between the two is tone. Um, so there's really only a choice of tone. Is this story best told in a humorous tone? Will it gather the right frame of mind for the audience to get the story? Or is it better if it's a drama and you'll get it that way? Um, you know, th those, are, those are artistic choices. But I, I'm, I'm not sure. I think that all good stories have what you're saying, have that, 
that emotional component to it to make it worthwhile. And that's true of even the greatest comic. You know, Groundhog's Day wouldn't be a great story mm -hmm. if it didn't have a strong emotional component of a guy learning to grow within himself to be the best person he can be, mm -hmm. even though he's fighting it every step of the way. That's the story. It's funny, but that's the story. You know, the, the very best comedies, to me, have that component. Love, uh, fear, all the things that we're all going through all the time. Where do you start? When you're, when you're coming up with a comedic or a dr dramatic st storyline, everybody has their own process. Could you walk us through like what, where you start? What, what is it that helps draw out that storyline? It's, you start with an inkling. What is the inkling? In some versions, it's, it's a world, it's an area that you see that interests you. It's, it's something you're experiencing that interests you. You know, I, I did a fair share of uh, father-son yeah. shows because I'm a father of a son yes. and I'm a son of a father. So those things are, are in my wheelhouse. Uh, I like music, so I do things that has to do with music and the world of music. I grew up kind of in show business, so that kind of interests me. I'm interested in the dynamic between people who are who have money and people who don't have money, because mm -hmm. I've I've had been very lucky to have been a middle class kid, but grown up with people who didn't have money, and it was like rough. Um, I you know, what love, you know, yeah. uh, marriage, the difficulties. Oh, he's of, like, he's cheating, guys. He's skipping to a later part of our show. Continue. Uh, I'm just saying, like, <laughs> those are those are. The, what do I want to write about? I want to write about the things that I, I'm going through. I'm seeing people go through and seeing the world around me go through. I and how that. do I best, what's a fun way or interesting way for me to explore it? Not just the audience, I'm thinking about me. I'm gonna have to live with this for a year, two years, three years. What is the interesting world I wanna be in? What are the interesting characters I wanna show? And what do those characters, how do I relate to every one of them? Mm -hmm. All the, I relate to the villains as well as the heroes. I relate to the side characters as well as the stars. I'm. I'm every woman. I'm all those people all the time. You talk about, um, I know you mentioned in an I quote interview. Chaka Khan in everything I do. Chaka so, Khan. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, yes. we're going to get some of that later, right, guys. Right. Uh, Wendell and Vinny was, ba was loosely based off your life, but when you think about your um, body of work, is there a specific story or episode or moment in, that just really is your favorite or you think of with fond memories? Is there one So many. I love them all. It's like they're children. Every single show you do, you give birth to. Well, you do it too. Yeah. Every single thing I that know. you write, you it's love. so hard. You love them. It's Otherwise, you wouldn't, question. You wouldn't, a hard question. You wouldn't, you wouldn't put it out if you didn't love it. I mean, some were more successful than others. I prefer the ones that were successful because they make me feel good. Like, oh, I did it well. But there were some that died that, that I still loved. I was just at... Sketchfest uh, in San Francisco, uh, showing a movie I made 27 years ago called The Wrong Guy, which was a disaster failure. But a cult hit. But a, now a cult hit. <laughs> um, but at the time, I loved that movie yeah. and couldn't believe what a disaster it was and couldn't understand why it was a disaster. And it took many, many years for college kids to discover it and say, oh, this is pretty great. That's so. It. It's a great thing, though, just following what you're passionate about versus what we necessarily think is right in the industry. And it usually leads to, uh, to not overnight success. Yeah. But look at this one. Oh, but, but, uh, but I've written pilots that I love that didn't get picked up yeah. that I thought would be great hits and, and unfair that it wasn't picked up. And I've written other things that did get picked up. And I was like, I don't think we did it so good. But they bought it anyway. So, I mean, uh, there's a lot of mercurial wisp of people other people's ideas that fit into all of this that make things go and don't go but all i can be responsible for is trying to make the best version of it i can make and sometimes i'm right sometimes i do the best version sometimes i do not the best version and i have to learn from that i want to talk a little bit about life imitating art art imitating life um and get a little i'm gonna get a little hippie on you because there's always been this great rumor that mm -hmm. I'm sure you've heard, conspiracy theory about The Simpsons. Yeah, everybody talks about this, they, that they we predict the future. We predict the future. It's so, it's, it's and, so stupid. And but I, I personally believe that in many ways, as creators, 
when we do put like a storyline or an idea into the consciousness of an audience Mm -hmm. and many times life does imitate art and it does create in some way so is are there any truths to the to the rumors how do you feel about it well it's ridiculous what what we do is on the simpsons is i think we're i don't know the count but it's like five jokes a minute (laughs) ten jokes a minute so if the show's 22 minutes long and there are ten jokes seven jokes a minute uh, you're going to have hundreds of jokes and all of them are going to be very silly, stupid ideas. So you do that 24 episodes a year for 34 years, there's going to be thousands and thousands of bad ideas or crazy ideas that are, are put out there. And some of them, the odds are some of them will come true. If one percentage of those ideas actually came true, does that make us prognosticators or does that just make the odds? I don't know, Jay. I think does I, it? <laughs> I don't I don't think it does. I think if we thought the stupidest idea of all time is Donald Trump to become president and then he became president, that's on America. That's not on us. But this is what I'm saying. I think sometimes that 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 life imitates art. You might not well, It have does, but it's not I don't through. think I'm not sure that we're um Responsible pushing for we're it. pushing it in any particular okay. direction. Okay. Well, and I also don't first. think we're tapping into a flow of ideas that our future is coming and we're tapping into it. I just think we're making silly jokes and silly jokes sometimes come true. <laughs> that is the best Disney caption I've I ever I have a watch heard. that I can talk to people on. <laughs> that Dick Tracy had a watch that he could, that talk, he could talk to people, to people on. on. So is that is this watch because somebody saw Dick Tracy? Maybe. I don't know. I mean, we're going to have to call up Apple and find out if yeah. there any Dick Tracy fans yeah, in the exactly. house. Um, I am going to move to a segment that I yeah. love. I think that so much about building character and telling stories is about your environment and your belief system and things that you talked about, how okay. you view the world. And so we brought you your favorite drink. Yes. Your Diet Dr. Pepper. Diet Dr. I, Pepper. I asked what your favorite drink Delicious. was. <laughs> um, what does that drink... What does that, why Diet Dr. Pepper? Is there? It's delicious. It's delicious? It's delicious. Of all the prune-based sodas, <laughs> it is the most delicious. I didn't know it was a prune-based soda. I believe it's a prune, prune flavor. A prune based. Based I don't soda? think there's a, 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 a iota of prune in here. But it's just chemicals, but it, it's prune-based. Dr. Right. Pepper's a prune-based soda. That is uh, new news to me, all right. but for all of you with stomach issues. Yeah, no, I don't think it helps. <laughs> it doesn't, stomach, soda does not help stomach issues. But uh, but it, it's got a good flavor to it. That's all. Uh, you told me that your favorite song, one of them, because you gave me a couple. Mm-hmm. And, and just for our audience, Charlie Cogan, Jay's son, is an excellent musician. And I've heard him play, so go check him out. Uh, one of them was I Hope I Don't Fall in Love Yes, by Tom Waits. What does this song remind you of? It brings me to a world... Well, I'll tell you what it reminds me of. It reminds me of my 20s, first of all. It reminds me of, uh, I wasn't a bar guy, but I would hang out with people and, and uh, you know, have crushes and hopes and dreams of love and all those kind of things happen. But that song isn't about my life. That song is about a world that I didn't really live in. That's Tom Waits' world was about, you know, bar flies and people who are troubled and people who have uh, issues. Like that song is called I Hope I Don't Fall in Love With You. And it, the next verse is I Hope You Don't Fall in Love With Me because his heart has been broken many, many times. When I heard that song and fell in love with that song, my heart had not been broken many, many times. I wanted my heart to be have, have been broken many, many times. Mm-hmm. I wanted to have had the experience and the depth of what I was hearing in that song. Mm. And that song brings me to that world of heartbreak, of hope. And in the, that particular song ends in, in a sweet, sweet love. They do fall in love, kind of. There's a, there's a moment where the opportunity happens and a guy meets a girl. Uh, but it's a dark world. You know, it's, 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 it's people who are, have more mystery than I do. And I kind of, that was appealing to me in my 20s and still appealing to me today. There's a lot of largesse and interesting depth in music. Frank Sinatra's, what he, when he sings a song because of the life he lived, you go, oh, yeah, he means it. Like, I don't know that. I don't know that at all. But that's what comes across when I hear certain people sing certain songs. And that it feels like they're telling me their truth. And that felt like truth 
And it was the kind of thing where I wanted that truth. Bruce Springsteen, similarly, mm -hmm. you know, these, this town rips the bones from your back. It's a death trap. Like, he's talking about this rough world in New Jersey, yeah. and I'm this soft kid from Encino going, yeah, that's right, <laughs> that's me. I was, it's never going to be me and never was me, but it was a hope, a, a dream at some point that that was going to be me, that I would live the kind of adventurous life of that. Yeah. If you see Bruce Springsteen now, he sings Born to Run, and everybody goes, yeah, Born to Run, and nobody in the audience is Born it's to Run. Born to Run at They're all. all very happy to go back home and sell insurance. Nobody's leaving. Everybody's fine, but the fantasy of it is still deep in their mind and set from their adolescence and it's still there. I went to my first Marley concert this year. Yes. And that audience, very similar. It's yeah. A lot of people singing yeah. <laughs> about everything the Marleys sing about. And you look around the audience and you think to yourself, wow, <laughs> this couldn't be further away from their existence. But it cr provides that escapism. It provides sure. that transportation. Sure. And, and maybe it influences them just a little bit to have more love yeah. and more, you know, more peace and more hope. When you were, when you were growing up, was there anyone around you who was like, uh, I know for me, uh, I had incredibly supportive parents, but they always had me searching for a backup plan. Mm -hmm. For you, was there anybody who was like, yeah, this is a great idea. Go be a writer. Go be a comedian. Or was it more uh, no, no silence from the people around you? I mean, my dad always worried about my future set and didn't think show business was the kind of show business that uh, being a writer was a solid, safe place. He wanted me to be a lawyer or an agent or something like that where you could have belong to a company and that was safe for, for him. And I understand that because my son wants to be a musician and that's scary. But my mother was a great cheerleader. My, I could fart and my mother would go, fantastic, you're the best, unbelievable. So her Love and, and, and cheering was very helpful, but also didn't mean much because she was not discerning. She wouldn't go like, oh, that's good and that's not good. It was sort of like, everything's good. So it, to me, in my mind, that I can't really trust her opinion about what's good or what's not good. But I appreciated the encouragement. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I had a lot of encouragement from a lot of people who weren't my father. Like people, who, other writers around me. Barry Levinson was encouraging when I was a kid, and and uh, this writer Barry named, Levinson yeah. was around you when you were a kid. Yeah, and Al Rogers was. Can I come to your cocktail party? Like, what was what was that like? Well, my, he worked with my dad on the Carol Burnett show. I know, but so, I mean, as a kid, with having. These... I mean, he wasn't. He wasn't. He hadn't written Diner yet. Yeah. You know, he was just a guy, a writer, but he was. He would. Talk to me, and and uh, Valerie Curtin, who was his partner at the yeah. time, would talk to me as an adult and ask me questions about what I thought things were, I love and that. I was like, and truly encouraged by that, and really felt like, oh, my opinion matters to people who were slightly younger than my parents, but just you know, hipper seeming, um, you know, I and I got that from a lot of different corners of the world, and a lot of Jan Murray, stand-up comedians, or Tony Fields and Jan Murray, who were old. Older comedians uh, that my father used to work for were very encouraging to me. And Bob Newhart was very encouraging. There were a lot of really nice professional people who took an interest in me and were kind. That's, and I appreciate that. That's really beautiful. Yeah. You got that experience. Yeah. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit. Uh, rapid fire, but not rapid fire okay. questions about your environment. All right. Uh, I want to start with the word home. When yep. I say the word home, what does that mean to you? Uh, anywhere my family is, anywhere people I love, it's not a building. It's a place where people are. It's, uh, I don't, I'm not attached to buildings. I'm attached to relationships. Home is where the great relationships, the warm relationships are. What about the word heaven? What do you think of when I say the word heaven? Fake. <laughs> okay. And hell? Fake. Okay. Uh, what food... Do you find most? Wait, let me go back. Heaven and hell also. <laughs> heaven is like ecstasy. You know, I felt like I was in heaven in moments in my life through, through ecstasy. Hell is just the epitome of difficulty and all that kind of stuff. But those are those are exaggerations. When you sure. say the actual words, it's like, oh, okay, well, that's, that's crazy. But what's the next one? Okay. What food do you find most comforting? I don't know. I love food and Me I don't, too. I like everything. I like so many different kinds of food that I don't, if I'm down 
And I'm really sad. I don't go for any particular thing, but I do go for food. But it could be Chinese food. It could be pizza. It could be ramen. It could be steak. It could be thing. Uh, it's never a dessert. <laughs> it's never, I never go for like a cake or a cookie or ice cream. It's like a meal. It's something that somebody made. It's like a. Do those a, elicit any memories for you or are they like. Well, when I think of memories of food, it's sometimes great restaurants I've been to in my life, sad meals I've had alone. Okay. I have lots of memories. When I was a kid, I used to barbecue steaks by myself. Why? Yeah, because nobody was home. Oh. And so that was a little sad, but also delicious. And I could have steak. So I don't know. We did not barbecue steaks as a kid. I made tortillas with cheese and ketchup. No. <laughs> that was our comfort food. Uh, what sound yeah. makes you smile? Wow. My, sing my kid's singing. My, his voice, his songs. He's a brilliant. I know dads, parents love their kids' music, but I'm an asshole. I would tell my kid if he sucked that he sucked. And I've told people that I thought it sucked, that they sucked. His voice is fantastic. His lyrics and his music is beyond fantastic. So I don't know. I like, I like hearing That's him. That's a perfect answer. How do you define love? I define love as a meeting of the spirits like my spirit i can i can love and do love many many people who i connect with i love them i can share my love with them love is warmth love is kindness love is contact love is all that stuff that's different than being in love mm -hmm. in love to me is something else that that is rare and i have with my wife but but love love spreads everywhere it's bob marley it's, it's like you know <laughs> it's, it's it's definitely bob marley guys. yeah but i'm saying like it's I love, I was uh, like in Sketchfest with Dave Foley and Dave Higgins, my people, people, the two people I love. Yeah. I share a, a, a world with, I've shared 30 years with. I love them, but I can also, I love many people. I love you. You call and you spread love. You're very joyous. I love and I like, and, 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 and we hung out on the strike line, but we hung out before. You just have a good spirit. And if you ask something of me, I wanna, I wanna do it. And if you, and I, 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 I feel that there's a connectivity. That's love. And I'm doing my podcast, Don't Be Alone with Jake Hogan, yes. is about that love. It's about not being alone. It's about being connective. I know the, I, the jokes, the title's a joke because it says, you know, don't be alone with Jake Hogan. It sounds a little pervy and weird. But, but the, the truth is I did it to be face to face with people like this. I don't do, I try not to do Zoom things. I want to be in, in, in people's faces and I want to connect with them. And I want to show other people, especially younger people, that connectivity isn't texting it's not emailing even it's talking and so you have to hear people's voices and better if you can hear them and see their faces we have we have a couple more questions that will help us build the character that is jay kogan but why don't you tell us a little bit about your podcast since it came up we watched your episode with your wife and lisa we watched several of your other episodes. Mm -hmm. I particularly love the wife and Lisa episode because I love watching you guys uh, work out relationship right. dynamics on camera right. because it's something you're so good at in your writing. And just to watch it play out real time just gave great insight into just, you know, how you process things. It was fun. It was also brave of my wife to come on and you're talk so about brave. that stuff. I love well, how she had her had her phone with all the notes right. of the things she wanted to. Right. She she had notes, guys, of the comedic punches she the, wanted to throw at Jay. The thought the the idea was to have my wife come on and tell me five of the things she really that bug her uh, that I bug her with, and I was going to tell her five things that she bugs me about, and we were going to have our friend Lisa Kudrow who helped get us together, observe us, and be able to sort of discuss uh, what we translate, what Brown does and what I do to each other. Because <laughs> Lisa's very much like me, but she's Brown's best friend. Yeah. So she knows both of us quite well. And so it was kind of fun to do. Um, uh, so I, It's a great I, dynamic, and because and Lisa has played um, a psychologist before yeah. TV. <laughs> it was like a little reminiscent right. also of, of, yeah, it was a great but You want to be her. authentic. <laughs> but the whole trick to it, the whole trick to any of this is being authentic. Like the, the, I only listen to podcasts and watch podcasts because I want to get to know people and I want to see their true selves. It's not a put on. I'm not interested in making a put on. I'm yeah. interested in honestly being authentic and I want people to be authentic with me. And that is part of the connectivity I'm l looking for. 
And that is part of the, that's the recipe for love mm -hmm. is finding authentic selves to relate to. It, it came through. That and was... that's, what's, that's what the podcast is. And that's why I do it. And it's every week. And I hope that. Uh, Where can people listen to it? All the platforms, every place, right? It's like Apple and Amazon and Spotify and YouTube and every place that you can get a podcast. And you talk to some great storytellers too. What are some episodes that are coming up? Uh, well, I mean, the, in the past we've had, this week Andy Richter is on, we have Pete Holmes, we've had like it's Lisa Kudrow, we've had Gary Goleman we just recorded and uh, Brian Cranston's coming up. And these are people who are, are my friends. Yep. Uh, Kevin Pollack was on. They're funny, interesting people, but they're also people I know and I like. And I, I, and and even Pete Holmes came on. I didn't know him. I just asked him to be on. But I'm just a huge fan, yeah. and I was able to feel like I get to know him. And it was great to have him sit there. And he is the most authentic person you'll ever meet. I, I love him. He's just so smart and funny as a comedian. But I can't also, wait for that episode. But it's, it's out. You can watch it's it. Out? It's out. It's, oh yeah, it, it's old. I yeah. haven't been staying up, yeah. staying up. I so you can watch, on. you can go back in the library and, and hear <laughs> Pete Holmes. It's fantastic. Okay, jumping back in. Yeah. How do you define success? I define success by trying. Mm. That's success. That part. Trying. Yep. Doing. So that's success. It's not necessarily how it's received. It's the attempt. How about failure? The aborted attempt. The aborted attempt. Yeah. Failure is not trying. Failure is, um, I mean, ideally, you make something that you want to be perceived well, and hopefully it's received well. But if you make something and it's not received well, like the wrong guy was, sure, it's not failure to me. That's still, I made something. I got it done. That's success. That's so to important. get it done is success. How it's received is out of my control. Um, do you believe in magic? No. Okay. No, I don't believe in magic. I don't. I I believe in luck. I believe in luck. I believe in that, but I don't think it's magic. What about second chances? Oh yeah, that's all life is: is second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, infinity chances. How about love at first sight? Why not? Why not? I don't know that it's ever happened to me, but why not? I've I've had instant rapport. I wouldn't say that's love at first sight. But I've had instant rapport with people. Does that count? I don't yeah. know. Okay. Then instant yeah. I believe in instant counts rapport. Counts in my book. Okay. Without considering time, mm -hmm. ability, or money as an obstacle. Right. What is the one thing you've always wanted to do or learn? I wanted to become the emperor of China. The emperor of China. The emperor China. of China. <laughs> yeah. But, well, given the parameters that you've presented, <laughs> I could... Yes, I could do that. That's that. all in that. Why the Emperor of China? China seems cool. <laughs> it does. To start seem with cool. that, China seems cool. And uh, in the past, the emperors had pretty cool lives. So there's that. Uh, in a more serious uh, vein, what, uh, what would I do if I could do anything? I don't know. I'd lose more weight. I'd be healthier. Mm. I'd be thinner. I would be, in general, more productive than I am sometimes. Well, you're so productive. Well, but I don't feel as productive as I could be. Yeah, that's um, a curse of a creative. Uh, but <laughs> I, I don't know. I travel slightly more. I get anytime I travel, I love it. But my you know, time is limited in this. The, the question said, "There's no no limitation, no limitation on time." Right. And and I wish that that were true. But since there is a limitation on time, you have to prioritize right. and do what you can do. But in a world where there's no limitations, or we had many lifetimes, I would do everything. What word best describes you as a storyteller? Um, too logical. Too logical. Yeah. Sometimes I, I don't, I, I sacrifice emotion for logic. Okay. And, uh, and, and I have to remind myself that the human heart is not logical. Mm, I hear that. What inspires you or drives you? Uh, time clock inspires me. Uh, bills inspire me. Like getting paid and working inspire me, but also, a, a fabulous idea. Like I'll I'll be driven for with a fabulous idea until it until I hit a brick wall and then I'll hate it. Yeah. But I'll drive and drive and drive and drive. This is great until I hit the wall. And the thing to get me past the wall is the other stuff. Somebody wants to see it and I could get paid for it and it could be good and I don't want to waste the time I just spent making this. Uh last question. What first thing that comes to mind 
is your favorite story? Uh, honestly, the first thing that came to mind is Exodus. My favorite story Exodus. is is Moses, the whole Moses story. Oh my God! And it's not not to be. I'm not super religious, and it's not a Jewish thing. I just think it's a great story. A pauper who's then picked up by a princess and becomes a prince, but then throws that away in the uh, effort to get to his true self and true meaning to himself, and then winds up leading those people that he then discovers he belongs to on a journey of righteousness and and faith One to going somewhere. It's, it's amazing. It's an amazing story. I don't believe it for a second, but it's an amazing story. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. What, what a great way to end, Jay. I want everybody to know where to find you. Uh, right here at this bar. This, I'm never leaving. Yes. Right in front of the uh, I got him to move in, Diet everybody. Dr. Peppers. You can find me at Jay Kogan on Twitter, which I do Philosophy Fridays still on Twitter. I do uh, my, my podcast, uh, Don't Be Alone with Jay Kogan. And you can email me at dbawjk at gmail.com, and I'll respond to that. And you can find me on all the internet things, Facebooks and, and Instagrams and TikToks and whatever. That's so generous yeah. of you, Jay. Thank you so much for coming on Curiosity. Thanks for having me. This is awesome. Studio. We yeah. loved having you. And yeah. I hope you guys have a little more insight into the storyteller that is Jay Kogan. Oh, well, thank you for having me. All you lovers and friends, come in, come in. Have a seat out there and have some bread.